Oh. <laughs> That's good. Ted, you live? Good. All right. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to ShmooCon 10. So thank you for getting out of bed so early in the morning. Um, if you're confused, you're in Belayet, uh, which is our defensive track. So I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Walker here, who has been a developer, uh, architect, researcher, and now a program manager at DARPA. And today he'll be talking about DARPA's Cyber Grand Challenge. Please. Thanks, Adam. Good morning, everybody. So a lot of you may know about DARPA's history of challenges and how in 2004, DARPA challenged innovators worldwide to build prototype self-driving cars and race across the desert. The idea was create a high-stakes global challenge and select innovation through competition. And these vehicle grand challenges served as the beginning of the self-driving car revolution. And what in 2004 seemed improbable the idea that self-driving cars could drive out onto America's highways, now in 2014 seems like an inevitability. So if we want to look 10 years ahead in computer security and build a challenge that could revolutionize our field, where can we find a competition format that compelling? Because certainly our field has nothing as accessible as vehicle racing. And when it comes to computer security, it's very difficult to build a compelling challenge because we're up against fundamental limits. Before we even had anything resembling a modern computer, uh, Alan Turing gave us the halting problem. He proved to us to construct software, but to evaluate software. Their task is to formulate a concrete input with correctness or processing property. Uh, maybe it causes a crash. But the way that this challenge phase works is if you can construct an input that shows that your competitor's program is faulty, you gain points and that solution loses points. Now the example I've given is uh, binary search. And I've showed that there's an integer overflow in the uh, binary search algorithm to the left. What's interesting is that this algorithm came from a text called Programming Pearls and was later put in the JDK. Uh, and this bug survived uh, undiscovered for over a decade in a tested, proven reference text, uh, which just goes to show how tough these fundamental problems are that we're up against. Uh, it's very difficult even to know that very small algorithms are correct. If you do a Google search for nearly all binary searches and merge sorts are broken, you can read a write-up of it. So how can we compete? When the answers to our question are undecidable, uh, the answer that top coders put forth is consensus evaluation. If we can't say this program is secure or this program is correct, maybe we can say it is as secure or as correct as all the brain power in the room says it is. So can we apply this to computer security? Well, it turns out that the security community has embraced the same principles in the construction of their skills competitions, capture the flag. So, Capture the flags, uh, specifically fully networked, head-to-head um, -head capture the flags, uh, start out with a flat ecosystem of software. We'll consider that the specification. Uh, a, a bunch of programs that have flaws built into them. And phase one is the constructive phase. Every competitor builds defenses to try to defend the software. And phase two, again, is the challenge phase, where everybody tries to create concrete inputs that can bypass the defenses and score against the software, proving that the defenses uh, are ineffective. The difference here is that the constructive phase and the challenge phase and the capture the flag are played simultaneously uh, at the same time over the entire length of the exercise. But between top coder and capture the flag, what we have here is a case of convergent evolution. In the face of fundamental limits, consensus evaluation is how we can do grading. 
And what we hope to do in Cyber Grand Challenge is harness this to identify breakthrough technology. Consensus evaluation is the heart of DARPA's Cyber Grand Challenge. And this is a challenge in the DARPA tradition. We want to draw on the lessons given to us by the computer security community and adopt the skills competitions used to test today's best defenders and analysts and challenge the field of automated program analysis to take the reins of our computer security apparatus and build an analysis engine that can act with disruptive speed faster than, than any human analyst and at machine scale. We hope to use Capture the Flag as an incubator, a place, a research lab in the real world where we can grade the efficacy of these solutions, put a whole bunch of approaches forward in the, in the grand challenge tradition and use competition to select the ideas that work. And what we hope to do is think about computer security in a new way not as a contest of experts and tinkers, but someday as the domain of machines. Now to get there, uh, we have to put forward our premise, and that's that these contests, Capture the Flag, are an alternative software ecosystem, but uh, their challenges and constraints mirror those imposed in, in, on uh, real world network defenders, that the skills and incentivizations are, are authentic. So let's start at the beginning. What do I mean when I say an alternative ecosystem of software? So every capture the flag exercise starts with a bunch of uh, software called challenge binaries. And what's interesting about these is that they're built from scratch for every game. When you walk into a capture the flag, nobody's analyzed any of the software and you don't know anything about it. Um, if you take uh, any of the you know, core tools um, or reverse engineering or network monitoring tools that you may be familiar with, things like Wireshark, uh, or snort and you connect it to a capture the flag network, the knowledge quanta, the filters, the signatures, um, the parsers inside those tools aren't going to be able to make any sense out of the protocols spoken on a capture the flag network because they're built just for that game. They are a custom uh, ecosystem. And that means that the only way to gain knowledge in a capture the flag is through binary reverse engineering, to treat the software as the specification and to learn what it truly does. So, uh, this particular example is from DEF CON Qualifiers 2007. Uh, this was a service that spoke its own protocol. Uh, it was a multi-process, multi-threaded networked hashing service. And it used uh, the pthread mutex library to guard its concurrency. And it contained a flaw where because of a concurrency flaw, a lock-unlock flaw uh, that was activated via race condition, um, if you could find that flaw, then there was memory corruption and the memory corruption could violate a security property. But this is just one example um, of the authentic problems cooked into synthetic software that's, the hist that's uh, part of the tradition of Capture the Flag. So having talked about the software ecosystem, let's talk about the constraints, uh, the challenges that are, that are imposed on you in a live fire CTF. So first is attribution and reputation. On the real internet, we can't make a, a snap judgment about any IP address and say, this IP address is good, this IP address is bad. Um, we have to consider every connection and its content individually. And th that constraint makes sense on a network as vast as the internet. But inside of a limited network like a capture the flag with maybe 10 or 11 hosts, um, it becomes very difficult to mirror. So the way that this constraint is mirrored in the game is that all connections are put through a network mixing appliance, uh, usually a source NAT uh, that's randomizing, and it gives every connection a new source IP address. So everything's mixed together, and you have to uh, deal with a problem as big as attribution on a real network. Um, the second problem is resilience. Um, in the real world, our challenge is not as hard as surviving a single red team assessment once a year. We have to continually defend users' data 24 hours a day. And the way that on the Capture the Flag network this constraint is mirrored is through the introduction of new flags behind every service at random intervals so that you're not just uh, guarding a service, you're guarding a service continually throughout the game. And finally, there is the problem of availability. If you're told that your software may contain flaws, as most software may, and that it's going to be connected uh, to a network um, where its security is going to be assessed, then the best way to get a, a high score is not to connect your services. But in the real world, we can't do that. In the real world, we have software that uh, 
that uh, may have uh, security flaws in it, and our users need to take advantage of that, uh, that service. So the way that this is represented in the game is through a special agent called a service puller that interacts with every service in the game, speaking its own protocol, making um, highly authentic, high availability requests, and in your attempts to defend the software, you have damaged its function or performance in some way, and decrementing the score of anyone who damages the software. So we have, uh, we have challenge binaries as the base, the constraints layered on top. Let's talk about the vantage point that you're allowed to defend software from uh, during the exercise. So I've talked about the service polar, the, the traffic you must support, and competitor proof of vulnerability, and how it all goes through a mixing appliance. So you can't tell it apart by a address. You have to do it through content inspection. Now, capture the flag formats vary, but uh, in general, you're going to pass through a network defense layer. In the network defense layer, um, you're going to have some sort of monitor and or modify appliance that can do traffic inspection. And the goal here is um, if you make modifications, don't disrupt the service puller and do disrupt competitors' proofs of vulnerability. And then the second place, uh, the, the, your second vantage point, is going to be the challenge binaries themselves. Um, in, in these games, the, the reference challenge binary that you're given is uh, just a guide. You're allowed to reformulate it in any way you wish. You can armor it, you can reformulate it, you can put custom defenses in there. The requirements are simply do not damage the function or performance and do make it more secure. And Cyber Grand Challenge is no exception here. Um, the idea is support the service puller, don't support anything else. So, that's the vantage point, the challenge binaries, the constraints. What's the game plan? If I sit down to play this game at a high level, uh, what, are, what are the actual engineers and competitors going to be doing? Well, at the beginning, you're going to uh, gain access to the challenge binaries for the first time, and you are in an analysis race. So the first thing you're going to want to do is triage the hard problems apart from the easy ones and split them up. And to do that, you may need to unpack the function of some of these uh, pieces of software if their function is uh, obfuscated or, or uh, hidden. Now, many of you who are, are, are reverse engineers are going to be familiar with uh, what analysts are going to bring to bear to start with. Some sort of input generation harness, maybe a Python script, uh, a static analyzer, maybe IDA, and a dynamic env a debugging environment, um, VDB or GDB or some sort of uh, hopefully programmable debugger, and you're going to create input, trace its execution with the dynamic execution environment, follow it in the static analyzer, inform what uh, uh, data flow paths you have, maybe generate new input, and continue this cycle trying to learn about the protocol and trying to learn about potentially security harmful inputs. But the field of program analysis also contains a lot of other techniques. Uh, you could use fuzzing, you know, vast quantities of input generation, maybe randomly generated in a Monte Carlo technique, hopefully informed or uh, by some sort of grammar about the, the software. Uh, Post-mortem analysis, static analysis, and then also techniques that uh, have been around in program analysis for a while but are starting to make their way into the mainstream of reverse engineering, um, constraint solving, constraint generation, SMT solvers, and, uh, and the various challenges that go along with these automated techniques like memory aliasing and memory models. Certainly this program analysis stack that I have up on the board is not a complete map, but it's representative of some of the techniques brought to bear. But all of this work is being done to find traces through the program that may be security harmful. And of course, your reverse engineering is not the only thing that's feeding this process. You're also looking at the network because you're in a race with your competitors. So your traces are being fed not just by your reverse engineering, but by what you see on the network. And a good team will be able to move partial information back and forth between these two sources. What you're going to end up with is a database of flaw knowledge about the software. And from this database, you can emit the knowledge quanta of computer security, fingerprints, signatures, patches. This is how you learn to accomplish tasks on the, on the, the game network. So why are these tasks important? Why do security professionals come to these games to recruit and train and network and learn? 
It's because these are highly representative skills that make up the computer security industry. This is the hard part, the part that is costly, expensive, and requires experts. So if my premise to you today is that potentially we could automate some of these hard parts, then it behooves us to ask the question, in 2014, how far are we towards this goal? What's the state of automation on this map in 2014? And the answer is, in isolation, there's some proof that we can do all of this. There's commercial software that can do some of it. There's academic proofs of concept that cover the rest. Uh, there's automated triage for complexity. There's uh, the Microsoft Bang Analyze program for some automated triage of, of post-mortem analysis. Uh, there's widely available symbolic execution environments like S2E, commercial software that can do data flow tracing even in reverse. And there's even uh, published work that says that we can emit these knowledge quanta to some degree of fidelity automatically. A paper written by Don Song at Berkeley, Automatic Fingerprint Generation, showed that from a black box perspective, you could automatically generate fingerprints to identify software in the network. And uh, some work, including uh, the Sting project by David Brumley, has shown that you can automatically generate patches. But when we talk about uniting some of these technologies and building a, a, an integrated system, there's so much more to do. There's how to move partial knowledge between uh, uh, all these different uh, components. There's how to actually go from partial knowledge to a decision. There's putting the decision into action on the network. And then there's continually monitoring the consequences of your decision and having a strategy. So what we're actually talking about here, when we're talking about uniting all these technologies, building a competitive system, and going to play against experts, is we're talking about following in the footsteps of Deep Blue. And the road to Deep Blue wasn't, uh, wasn't built by just one community. A whole bunch of chess experts didn't sit down and decide to build uh, a dedicated chess machine, nor was it built purely by computer scientists. It was actually built by a new community built by bringing chess experts and computer scientists together to try and do something that had never been done before. And our hope with Cyber Grand Challenge is do it again. Take the world's best network pros and security pros, put them together with program analysis experts, and build a new competition community. Through competition, select excellence and see how far automated systems can get against this grand challenge. So if we are talking about following in the footsteps of Deep Blue, then we should take a look at the road to get there. Does anyone know who said that uh, uh, computers that could beat humans at chess was a grand challenge for computer science when that happened? I saw, I saw a half a hand, so I, I, I'll just answer. It's uh, Claude Shannon in 1950 wrote this paper said uh, that, that chess was a grand challenge. Um, but in the 20 years since uh, Shannon's paper in 1950, um, there was not a lot of prog promising progress. In 1970, computers still played very, very poorly against humans. And there was no, uh, no fidelity to be gained from competing humans versus computers because the only result we got was that the human always won. So in 1970, the computer chess community, the ACM, had a novel idea. And they said, well, if, if computers can't play humans yet, maybe they can play each other. Maybe we can give them a league of their own, and we can use competition to select excellence amongst this technology. And what happened between 1970 and 1977 as the computers started playing each other was an explosion. We went from, in 1970, not having uh, a system that could play in a compelling way against humans, to in 1977, a computer defeating a grandmaster for the first time. And that's the effect that we want to try and capture here. We don't intend our, our first uh, all-computer tournament to be the end of the, of the story. We intend it for it to be the beginning. So this question that I asked the DEF CON audience last summer, could a purpose-built com computer play DEF CON Capture the Flag? My answer today is that someday they will. And the journey is going to begin at our final event in 2016, about the road to that day. So there are two tracks into the challenge. 
but I've grayed one of them out, the proposal track, and that's because uh, our proposal solicitation is, has closed and we're actually in review right now. And uh, now is a good time for me to sidetrack a bit and tell you that um, in, in order to protect that selection process, uh, when I'm speaking publicly, I'd like to have a conversation with the crowd afterwards. Um, today I'm not going to be able to do it, um, and that, that's just due to some internal policies. But uh, I w it was, uh, the timing was unfortunate, but I still wanted to come out and talk to, about the challenge today, and uh, I'm going to have to beg your patience in, in not being able to answer questions afterwards. But we still have the open track, which is open until June of this year. The open track is open to any eligible team, and there's no IP restrictions on any entrance system. So the open track still allows the creation of unfunded teams that are much more unfettered, and they play as equals in our events. The open track and proposal track are going to compete in the same events and be scored by the same method, with winners advancing on merit regardless of track. First at our qualification event in the summer of 2015 to select finalists. And lastly, in 2016, when finalist systems are going to play head-to-head -head at the Cyber Grand Challenge Live, uh, Cyber Grand Challenge final event, CFE, in a live network capture the flag between fully automated systems for a $2 million grand prize. So let's talk about that event. What I'd like to do today is uh, do a little bit of a technical deep dive into some of the things that we may see at this event, talk about how it works, talk about uh, the strategies and rich gameplay that's going to be possible. So first I'm going to introduce my network diagram. So this is a simplification in which we only have two hosts and three challenge binaries. In, uh, in our real game, we're going to have more hosts than over 100 challenge binaries. And our hosts are connected by a mixing appliance, like I've spoken about before, that blends on a per-connection basis legitimate traffic to the challenge services generated by the service pullers with adversarial proofs of vulnerability generated by competitors. And we have two scoring mechanisms announced in Cyber Grand Challenge, uh, registers and flags. Registers are set to a negotiated value at time of crash. Flags exist in memory. But like any capture the flag, an instrumentation mechanism is going to be operated which will detect scoring in real time. And this back-end infrastructure, operated by DARPA, is going to be used to monitor flags and provide event scoring. And this has some amazing measurement properties that separate this exercise from the real world. In the real world, defenses can count their matches, but they can't count misses. Uh, we don't see what evades us. And here we have a measurement framework that can count the misses as well, as well. so we're going to get real metrics, and we know which defenses are working. So when this game is recorded and released as an open source corpus for computer security research, I think there are going to be a lot of important lessons that we're going to be able to draw uh, from this inaugural event. Now, since this is an automated CTF, we don't have teams. We have reasoning systems. Full racks of dedicated computing equipment uh, and software fielded by competitors to play the game. And I've simplified this diagram into two systems, alpha and beta. So let's talk about the connections and abilities that alpha and beta have with regards to the network. First, each system is going to get a network tap. Uh, capture the flag differ a little bit in how traffic monitor and modify works. In our case, everyone gets a monitor tap. Um, and every system is going to have the ability to emit proofs of vulnerability into the network against competitors to score points and provide consensus evaluation for the entire game. Each system is also going to have the ability to field replacement challenge binaries. And again, these can be reformulated in any way that's compatible with our framework. Uh, advanced defenses, randomization defenses, um, uh, memory defenses. Uh, however uh, a, a system chooses to rebuild software, if it's compatible with our framework, they can field it. And each system has the ability to field network filters in a common language to a network appliance with the ability to modify traffic and to generate alerts. Now, if we want a high-fidelity simulation, we need to talk about what's missing from this map. We know in the real world that defenders scan for vulnerabilities, they emit patches, they emit network signatures. But what's critical is that these knowledge quanta are distributed to everyone. 
When a patch is put online, it can be reverse engineered to obtain information about the flaw it's designed to fix. And there's even research that shows that this transformation can be done automatically. A patch can even be reverse engineered to see if, while intending to make the software more secure, the patch actually introduced a vulnerability. Patches can introduce bugs. Defensive logic can introduce bugs. So every time we make a change to improve our defenses, we have to continually apply evaluation to ensure that we've actually made an improvement. So enter Shannon's maxim. Uh, easily summarized as the enemy knows the system, but perhaps better known to some of you as security through obscurity is no security at all. So there's good evidence that Shannon's maxim has powerful impacts on our defensive choices. Many of you will remember that during Mudge's time as a DARPA PM, he spoke here a few years back and he brought this slide. This was from DARPA's cyber analytic framework. And just as a refresher, what this is showing is that for one month, of the critical vulnerabilities that had to be patched, 17 were patched, six were in defensive software that was intended to protect systems and not make them weaker. So if we're gonna absorb this lesson and, and put it in the game, that's the reason we have consensus evaluation and that our competition framework distributes patches and signatures as they are fielded. So let's revisit this slide and let's add this last data flow. This is our consensus evaluation mechanism. Every competitor gets everybody, every other competitor's uh, binaries and filters. So the way the CyberGAN Challenge Framework works is this. When you submit a new binary or, uh, or signature, it's distributed to all other teams. And this has a lot of interesting implications. This means that if you make a change to software intending to improve its security and you actually weaken it, then a competitor that manages to evaluate this weakness is going to be able to score against you in a unique way. And that's going to provide consensus evalu evaluation ability to the entire game. This also means that highly specific patches and defenses could be mined by opponents for flaw information. It means that flaw information is going to move around this competition in a holistic way, potentially starting as partial information and more defined as each system works on the problem and vice versa. So when we connect all of these systems and we let them play this game head to head against each other, each system making discoveries, taking action on the network, reacting to each other in adaptive cycles. It's a pretty big ask. And some of you may be thinking to yourselves, is this really possible? I, I, re I understand that there's some academic proof of concept that says that we may be able to do this, but what's, uh, what's the real world state of the art right now? So I want to show you this slide. This slide is called Sage in One Slide. That's the Google search term to bring it up. It's released by Microsoft Research. And what this shows is that Microsoft is currently fielding a system which uses multiple techniques from that battery of program analysis uh, that I showed you earlier. Uh, constraint solving, fuzzing, smart input generation to emit concrete proofs of vulnerability against Microsoft software patch it prior to release. So there's a couple interesting data points up here. Uh, one is that the claim on the slide is that at 200 plus machine years, this is the world's largest fuzzing lab, but the other slide, that I, or the other point I want to show you, is that one third of all the critical security bugs found in Windows 7 were found by this system. So think about that ratio. Right now, two thirds of the bugs found in, er, er, reported in Windows were found by researchers, folks uh, like the competitors playing Ghost in the Shell Code at this con, and the other third was found by a, a reasoning machine backed with tons of computing power. So if today the ratio is two-thirds to one-third, what's the ratio going to be tomorrow? And why can't we take technology like this and put it into an integrated live network defense system and see how it does on its own? Let's play one more scenario. Let's take our two systems, alpha and beta, and start with the moment that beta discovers a flaw and formulates a scanner module for that flaw. Beta chooses to use this knowledge uh, to emit a challenge onto the network to prove that the service operated by Alpha is vulnerable. Now, what if Alpha has coupled its network monitoring capability to a dynamic execution environment or an instrumented debugger on the slow path, probably, processing inputs as fast as it can? And what happens when Alpha plays the input from Beta through this system and detects that there's a scoring event caused by this input? Now, in our hypothetical scenario, 
uh, let's say that alpha detects that this input is security harmful but doesn't have a complete model of the flaw. And so it chooses to field a network signature to block the flaw. Alpha fields this signature and it blocks just this input, but maybe not all possible scoring inputs. Now at this point something interesting happens because we have consensus evaluation and a copy of the signature is going to be distributed to everyone, including beta. And now beta can detect that alpha reacted to its probe. Beta can evaluate alpha's ability to respond to challenges. Beta knows something about how alert alpha is. And in the future, it may potentially exclude alpha from future discoveries. If alpha figured out this flaw when I scanned it, maybe I shouldn't scan alpha in the future. So this is significant. What we may actually see here as machines influencing each other's strategic decisions. We will have a chance to learn something new about the game theory behind computer security when this event is studied. Beta also has the option to continue evaluating alpha by fielding additional inputs. And as this happens, it may actually teach alpha how the flaw works. And alpha fields a patch. And now we've reached a fully defended state. Now we play another round. Now as we think through this scenario, I have a question for you. If we could do this, how fast is it going to happen? These are machines. We know how fast these cycles happen today. Researchers have provided us with really good data on this point. A pioneering paper titled Before We Knew It uh, applied the following methodology. They downloaded uh, tons of files from all across the internet, built a dated corpus, and then uh, as flaws were discovered, they mined those files to see when was the earliest existence proof that there was a file that exercised that flaw. And from this, they were able to gain uh, timeline data for how long flaws remain undiscovered. And their average was 312 days. We also have good data on how long it, it, it takes to just build and test a patch and get it out to the public on median of about 24 days. That, that time is coming down. But when we talk about uh, reducing at or increasing attacker costs, uh, we should talk about how time is currency. And right now, attackers have a lot of currency. I submit to you that our inability to cope with the scale of the problem in a timely manner contributes greatly to the imbalance of power that people talk about when they say that attackers have the upper hand. So let's play through another scenario. This time, Alpha discovers a flaw and decides that its strategy is to quickly patch first. Submits a reformulated challenge binary, and this flaw is immediately available for consensus evaluation. And that means that the, the challenge binary is handed over to beta. Beta receives a copy of this binary, and through different binary differencing of some type, also learns about the flaw and decides to field its own patched binary. And that's also distributed for consensus evaluation. And now the network, has reached a fully defended state entirely driven by machine reasoning before anyone can score against this flaw. And what I want to ask you today is, if we can do this, then how fast is it going to happen? And when we connect our finalist systems to the full competition network and a field of innovative prototypes and deliver to them an entire ecosystem of hundreds of samples of previously unanalyzed software, software which speaks protocols that nobody's ever seen before, and we have this measurement property that extends from this that means that all the knowledge that's going to, take, uh, that's going to be used on this game came entirely from machine reasoning. When we tell these systems to analyze the software, to evaluate their competitors' mistakes, to secure the software, to defend the network, what amazing cycles of adaptation and counteradaptation are we going to see? How close to the abilities of experts are these systems going to come? How fast and how big of a game are they going to play? And what kind of lessons is it going to teach us about the future of computer security? I believe that what we have here is a chance to build a window into the future. The spectators at our event are going to see not just a scoreboard, but a high fidelity uh, visualization into the heart of this game. 
and they're going to have a chance to see what computer security may someday become. I believe that we may someday look back on a time when we had to manually pull apart binary software and put it back together again to defend our networks with the same type of uh, wonder that our children look at rotary phones with. So if I've convinced you today that our industry is on the verge of threshold change, then I invite you to join us because the end of our event may be the beginning of a revolution. I want to thank everybody for coming out to listen today, getting up in the morning to see me, and uh, thank you to ShmooCon for the invitation to come and talk. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>